This is uh, about frontier science and cl doing clinical trials in special economic zones. This talk covers my experience running mini circles, phase one trial in Prospera, but it's also going to talk more generally about why these special economic zones or smaller jurisdictions are important for doing innovative research. Uh, generally, frontier science, in this case, we'll talk about longevity, augmentation, prevention, implants, and radical procedures. I think this is especially important because the FDA just doesn't touch some subjects, and this is part of the reason why longevity can't get funding, is because if the FDA doesn't say that it's valid, then how do you people believe that it's real, and then no one's going to fund tens of millions of dollars into the clinical trials to prove that it works. And so now we're stuck in this situation where it's impossible to move forward. Uh, similarly, like with augmentation and prevention, there's really not a lot of political will behind these things. And so it's hard to get traction, hard to get investment. Uh, with implants, it's, uh, it's hard to do prototyping. And then because you have to like go through so much work to get approval to put it into somebody, and then maybe you need to tweak it, and then you have to get approval again. And, and it just causes implants to be a huge pain. And then lastly, some radical procedures like the uh, tissue replacement, the full head transplant stuff. Like, there's just no way that it, uh, the IRB is going to approve that. And so we need to have other places to be able to test out these prototypes. So some of the shortcomings of the existing model is just the, the incentives, right? Like, these larger institutions have a lot to lose, but they don't have a lot to gain by approving things. And then that puts us in a spot where it's hard to just get approval to even do a study. This causes, to some degree, uh, invisible graveyards. So if, if a bureaucrat approves a study and 10 people die, it's a tragedy. But if they don't approve a study and then 20,000 people die because they didn't have access to a treatment, nobody knows that happened. It's not going to ruin their career. And because of this dynamic, it's, it's just really hard to actually do innovation. And then I will say that the FDA is reliant upon indirect bribery, where if you don't have an expensive lawyer that is friends with the FDA, they're going to think that you're not serious. Your application's not going to get reviewed. They're not really going to talk to you. I've seen this firsthand. It's a, not a great state of affairs. And then lastly, regulatory capture. Uh, if your treatment potentially disrupts a huge industry, and that treatment, that industry already has ties to the FDA and other institutions, then they're going to apply pressure to be like, no, don't approve it. It's not safe. It's you know, but but really, they're just trying to protect their own uh, profit margins. Uh, so a little bit of context, personal history. I was involved in a failed network state called BitNation. Uh, I was originally interested because of crypto UBI. But that got me invited to an event that was kind of like Esmeralda called Exosphere in Chile in 2016. That got me exposed to some biohackers who later reached out to me to test out an HIV gene therapy. That gene therapy ultimately wasn't working, but that group, uh, something spun out of it that led to mini circle and their full statin treatment. And a little context on that, uh, there's many levels of gene mods. Uh, the, the COVID vaccine for mRNA is supposed to be transient. It only lasts for a few days. Uh, mini circle plasmids are, are more like a year or so, depending on how they're done. And so I describe them as like the henna tattoo of gene therapy. And I think it's a relatively good way to dip your toes into gene therapy without necessarily committing to changing your chromosomes. And then more permanent versions like CRISPR or AAV uh, are, are going to be with you for the rest of your life. Uh, mini circles are a version of a plasmid that's had the bacteria removed. Uh, so that way your immune system doesn't pick it up as a threat. And therefore, uh, the cells that are modified uh, will continue to be modified throughout their lifespan, which is usually about a year on average. So the group built this plasmid mini circle for folostatin. It seems like it was working. They had some money, but they were facing the valley of death. In, in biotech, this is the idea that there's all these projects are trying to make it to the market, but they get stuck in a crevasse, and then they never see the light of day again because of funding issues, patent issues, coordination issues. And so the company was like evaluating, well, where are we going to do the study? They had some money, but not really enough to do a full proper study in the United States. 
Uh, we were looking at Ukraine and Roatan. I think uh, ended up making the right decision there. Uh, we visited the island in 2021, and it was honestly a little rough around the edges. Uh, uh, there were definitely some nice parts to it as well, though. And I've, I'm sorry, but I've tricked you into viewing my vacation slides. But this is uh, the beta building, like the first part of Prospera. And they had like a, a rickety barbed wire fence. And I like ran along this undeveloped beach and illegally immigrated into Prospera. It was, it was fun. Uh, so a little bit more about Prospera. It, it's kind of this brainchild of these like radical libertarians of like, what, what if we could have our uh, cake and eat it too? What if we could have this economic zone where we could, we're free to do whatever? Uh, first, it was proposed in 2011. Uh, the Supreme Court of Honduras struck it down, but then that right-leaning uh, president uh, sacked the Supreme Court, got it approved, along with some other laws that are kind of questionable. And that's honestly why Prospera is kind of in a difficult situation. The leftists are now in power. They hated that president. They want to undo everything he did. But there's kind of a standoff between the US suing Honduras in, a, in like an arbitration court versus the leftists who are trying to undo it. And so the current state of it is that they are not able to add more land into the zone. But at the same time, Honduras isn't interfering with the zone either. So it's kind of stuck at a state where they have some pieces of the island are annexed in, but they can't add more land. Uh, yeah, there's a low tax rate, Bitcoin's legal tender. It is kind of interesting. Our original idea was to rent a office in their beta building, but we ended up partnering with a existing stem cell clinic on the island that, that was perfect. They already had an IRB, they were open to doing research, and it was just a really good natural partnership. So the structure of the study, uh, we were comparing, there was no placebo. So we were kind of comparing the months before the treatment and then after the treatment. We were looking both at blood work and looking at met metabolic uh, things like lipids, uh, inflammation. And then we were also looking at DEXA scans. DEXA scans look at like body fat, uh, lean tissue, like muscle, and also bone density. We also took blood samples at zero months, three months, and 12 months, and we're using that to look at the actual follistatin levels in the serum. And then we had 43 participants who covered their own travel and testing ex expenses, but they didn't have to pay directly for the therapy. So it was kind of a, like, just cover your own expenses and, and get it for free uh, situation. Uh, let's see more details about the actual tests. Uh, I will say that we also did epigenetic age which is one of these like markers of aging, which that's a, that's a whole other concept, but it seems like it's kind of useful. Uh, the participants were mostly from the US or Canada. They were mostly longevity or fitness enthusiasts. After all, who's going to sign up to do something that no, not many people have done before? Generally, they were all healthy. We had a good age range, both genders, and recruitment was done via word of mouth. The structure that we did was that almost all of the participants went through a cohort where we kind of every month or two like planned out all the travel. We were all going to come down at this time. We were going to have like, a group dinner. And so my job as like a research coordinator, I ended up kind of being a tour guide visiting this island and driving people around in a van. And honestly, overhearing them talk about all the treatments that they did had some incredible alpha. So what were the results? No serious adverse events. Nobody had to go to the hospital afterwards. Fantastic. There was one reported adverse event with diarrhea, but if you've been to Roatan, you probably know that eating things there might lead to that, so not a big deal. Uh, we saw, on average, fat-free mass index uh, increase of almost two pounds. Uh, the body fat reduced, on average, almost 1%. And then epigenetic age, extrinsic, epigenetic age uh, decreased seven years, which is pretty substantial. Yesterday, Brian Johnson released a, uh, I, I don't know if it's gonna actually show, but I'm not gonna show this whole clip, but I encourage you to check it out on YouTube. I edited my DNA on a secret island to live forever. I love how he's like becoming Mr. Beast and just going full clickbait. But he overall thought that it was like a worthwhile intervention, and so that's, that's, that's great. 
Some other things that are happening on the island since then, uh, Lantern Bioworks is an uh, anti-cavity mouth bacteria is doing a phase one study for safety as well. Uh, the founder of which is around here if you're, if you're curious to learn more. Unlimited Bio is taking a plasma treatment that was approved in Russia and now bringing it to the island, both for the condition that it was approved for, which was ischemia, but then they're trying to extend it to things that maybe wouldn't have gotten approval, and, that, and this is like a rejuvenation of like the face and potentially uh, hair growth. And then one last company that is starting up there, Symbiont Labs, is like an augmentation implant company. And we've all like probably heard about the magnets, RFID chips and whatnot. They're trying to develop the technology around coding implants so that way they can start adding more interesting things like biosensors. Maybe like your blood glucose, your O2 levels, you can have that embedded, potentially get more accurate readings and potentially charge it remotely so that you can keep it in there uh, for a longer period of time. So benefits of running a study in Prospera. Mostly it's just, it's faster. There is an IRB there that is open to actually getting things done rather than just trying to wash their hands of any liability, which is kind of the MO. And so being able to very quickly get feedback on your proposal and like finally get to the point where it's approved, it, it saves a lot of burn time. It makes it so that it's just feasible to get going. Uh, trials, I would say, generally are cheaper than running it in the US just because of all the overhead costs. And then the setting. It's nice to have, it's, it's a reason to go to that island, to be real. And so some legal approaches that Prospera offers that are kind of innovative. By default, you can enter into a common law contract. And so you don't even need an IRB to approve your treatment if you, if you don't want to. But in that case, you are personally liable for any damages up to like a cap of a few hundred thousand dollars. So if you really just want to quickly innovate and you're confident that what you're doing is safe, you can just enter into a contractual agreement with the other person. Uh, Prosper also has provisions so that if something's already approved in an OECD country, you can just start selling it there without having to go through any additional hoops. And then you can also, of course, go through a Honduran or Prosperin institutional review board, which is kind of the traditional uh, model. Or you can propose your own regulatory framework and uh, get it approved by the Prospera Council, and now you are able to govern your business in whatever way you think is right. So interacting with the contract research organization on Prospera, I've seen a few different funding models. You can, of course, have the, the part participants fund it, or you could have the company fund it, or the clinic maybe take some equity from your company and then they will front up some of the costs of running the study or some mix thereof. What's really exciting, novel, innovative here, I think, is that uh, after you do the phase one study, you can potentially start commercializing it if an IRB approves that uh, study as being safe enough. So it's kind of a right to try model where if you can prove that it's not dangerous, you can, you can start selling it. Uh, so some obstacles, patient logistics and recruitment can be difficult. Uh, I mean, there's kind of this weird position where like we don't really want to be seen as testing on the locals. So people generally fly down so that to avoid that uh, potential ethical dilemma. Shipping the treatments in can be annoying, processing samples, there's only so much equipment on the island. And then, is the FDA going to recognize this? Is, is still to be determined. Minicircle is currently in talks with the FDA, and it's not clear if they're going to accept this as a phase one and say, yes, you go do a phase two now. Or if they're going to be like, no, that's not a real place. Go do it someplace that's, that's real. I'll briefly say that uh, Bioshock is perhaps uncanny uh, in terms of uh, how much it kind of predicted this idea of a libertarian paradise that's very isolationist. This one, in that game, it's set under the sea, but there's all these plasmids, and that actually exacerbated inequality. They became addicted to these gene therapies, and then the society kind of like collapsed in and of itself, so uh, be aware. And then some systemic risks for Prospera. Like, if, if the biomedical tourism keeps expanding, then there's probably gonna be a race to the bottom, where people started out kind of on parity with the existing systems, 
And then it just gets crappier and crappier and, until eventually people get hurt and then something happens. And so adverse events could then be used as a political weapon against Prospera. And then going outwards, it might be that the FDA sees this as a threat and then they end up just like not accepting any data from that place, which could and really hamper doing research there. Some other jurisdictions that are worth considering, like Costa Rica is doing a lot of clinical research, great tourist destination, so it's a good choice. Mexico is less expensive than the US, but they still have a lot of regulation, so like the amount of time it takes is still pretty high. Colombia is where BioViva started doing some of their testing, uh, Liz Parrish and like the telomere lengthening, all of that. Panama has been pretty friendly with stem cells, and Thailand is also pretty open to gene therapy and stem cells, and seems like a good choice. And so yeah, why do these SCZs or smaller jurisdictions want clinical researchers? Uh, honestly, Prospera is like a real estate play long term, and so if they can get people visiting, get people living there, that's good for them, it increases their value. Uh, and, but mostly these smaller upstart places, they have more to gain than to lose. Whereas with the incumbents, they don't want to lose anything. So they, they are very uh, risk adverse. And then, yeah, there's just this value of innovation. Uh, Prospera is a great place to test something out, but then you're never going to be able to really scale it because of like the logistics issues, because there's not so many people on the island. And so, there's like a, a lot of value to maybe doing your phase one there, show that it's safe, show that it maybe it works, and then raise money, do it someplace else, and, and move forward. If you are intrigued, uh, there is going to be a human augmentation summit happening on Roatan and Prospera at the end of July. It's kind of part of Vitalia's ongoing effort to bring people to the island through their net, like a uh, pop-up city that is kind of cemented down and it's starting to become like a full-time residence thing. Uh, the, la the first half of it, it's gonna be mostly just hanging out on the island and then the last half will be um, actual programming. And then lastly, if you are interested in all this stuff, feel free to join my Telegram group for biohacking, gene therapy, DSI stuff. And if you are if you're curious, feel free to reach out.